So let's talk about the second law of thermodynamics. And what we'll discuss is how to evaluate entropy specifically. And then we'll discuss this, uh, a variety of processes like polytropic and isentropic processes. We'll discuss uh, the open system uh, and closed system sec uh, entropy balances. And we'll apply them to steady state devices and find other steady state relations. So first, let's talk about how to evaluate entropy. And so we, we saw previously that for an, a reversible process, and again, a reversible process being one where equilibrium is prevalent throughout the entirety of the process, uh, we can equate the heat within that process, the total heat within that process, uh, as the integral of uh, the temperature times uh, uh, with respect to the entropy. So Q is equal to the integral TDS. So it's natural to assume then, and it is correct, that one can uh, look at the area under a TS diagram. And I am sorry that the bottom here is cut off, but the, the abscissa, the x-axis is entropy. And uh, at least we can get a a value for a reversible process under this diagram. And so while it's not immediately useful, we can use that as a capping or as a maximum uh, efficiency for a variety of processes and devices. And we can kind of evaluate how our process or how our device is doing compared to that ideal process. Okay, and so when you look at a TS diagram, which I just I have one, a generic one over here, you can see that in the dotted lines, the dotted red lines, uh, you have the specific volume, and uh, the specific volume tends to uh, decrease as one goes up, uh, whereas the pressure tends to increase as one goes up. And you can see I have a, a, a two-phase dome, just like what we're accustomed to in the TV diagram. Uh, and then, and then we have a, a a liquid region on the left and a vapor region on the right. Uh, and I got that from a, I suppose, a British source with a O U R thing going on. Uh, you can also identify the critical state um, at the top of the dome. Uh, and so this is just a, a typical T S diagram, uh, which is which is sometimes useful depending on on your application for it. Okay, so let's look generally at the T S diagram. I can sketch out a cycle. So again, the y-axis here would be temperature. The x-axis here would be entropy. And so if I have a cycle here, uh, I, can, uh, I can then integrate under that curve and I would get the heat, the total heat that I get out of the heat, the hot reservoir, okay? Then I can, the, the area under the cycle is the heat from or to the cold reservoir. And if I subtract them, meaning I'm just looking at the red rectangle that remains, that's going to be the work, okay? We can also discuss uh, an enthalpy entropy diagram known as the Mollier diagram. And we're gonna be using it very soon when we discuss the steady state devices. And um, and it's it's quite useful in understand in understanding different processes and the efficiencies of a steady state device. Uh, you could see here uh, that the isobars are the are the ones that monotonically going go up. Okay, so the ones that uh, the these these sort of dashed lines and the isotherms, the constant temperatures, are the dotted lines. They go go like this. Okay. And uh, we'll we'll revisit these diagrams very very shortly. Okay, in the back of any thermal book, uh, one can see the entropy data there as well. The saturated the saturated entropy, uh, the superheated entropy, the uh, uh, the critical entropy for a variety of different um, substances such as water, uh, different refrigerants, ammonia, etc. Uh, and so uh, what I really want to show you here, and we'll do like a quick, quick example, is that during a phase transition, okay, uh, we, we've seen that uh, temperature and pressure do not change, okay? 
So they say when ice melts uh, or when water boils, uh, during that boiling process, let's say it's 1 atm, uh, at about 100 degrees Celsius, uh, the temperature won't change. So if you stuck a thermometer into uh, a, a, a pot of water and you heated it with the water up, you would see the temperature rise uh, until until you reach the boiling point, at which point you will still be adding energy into the system, but the temperature won't rise anymore. So even though the heat is increasing, is, is added to the system, the temperature is not the metric by which one can uh, measure the heat that is being uh, absorbed by the system in this particular scenario. We call that heat during the phase transition, the heat of transition, we call that the latent heat. Latent meaning hidden, uh, as in it is not apparent. It is not an obvious heat that we can measure with a temperature like we usually do. It's not directly measurable. So if you remember our discussion of measurable variables, uh, heat in this case is not directly measurable because temperature is not uh, is, is not uh, is not an easy metric to get the heat. So uh, during that time, uh, we equate heat with enthalpy. And uh, enthalpy does not change with temperature at that time either. Q is equal to delta H. And we, we've seen in the tables that we can just take the enthalpy of the gas, which is at quality of one, the enthalpy of the liquid, which is at quality of zero, subtract the two, and that gives us the delta H of transition or the latent heat of transition uh, between a uh, liquid substance and a vapor substance at the prevailing temperature and pressure, okay? What we could do from the second law, since we know that uh, S is uh, equal to Q over T for a reversible process, uh, we can say that delta H of transition divided by the temperature of transition will give us the delta S of transition. And that is indeed the case. Uh, and so one can only I'll always get the delta S of transition directly from the first law even, just by dividing the delta H by the temperature of transition, uh, which, which in this case will keep the latent heat divided by the temperature of transition. Why is that? Because uh, again, there's no um, temperature and pressure, we can equate delta S directly with Q over T. Okay, so in this example, if we know that the latent heat of melting of water uh, at 1 atm is 335 joules per gram Kelvin, that means that during melting, we can get the entropy of transition to be positive uh, 1.22 joules per, per gram Kelvin. And during freezing, when the water freezes to ice, it will be exactly the same value, just uh, the negative of it. It would be negative 1.22 joules per grams Kelvin. And so that would be, in that sense, uh, reversible. Nothing is being lost during that transition. Okay. So while we're on that, uh, here we are, I'm showing you here that when you melt, the change in entropy is positive. And when you freeze, the change in entropy is negative. And so that might be that might kind of pique your interest in, in to why that is. How how is it that why is it that entropy decreases when when one freezes a substance? And so you may remember from uh, if you harken back to the days of high school or something, they, they discussed uh, entropy as a way to measure disorder, and that's something we haven't really discussed at all. Uh, and so I want to kind of um, uh, have a word on that. And so the, the word disorder is not very, is order or disorder. It does not really uh, have a quantifiable meaning to it. So we refrain from using that. Um, but there is some truth in that analogy, of course. <laughs> so this is the tombstone of uh, Boltzmann, who came up with well, the Boltzmann constant, K, K, KB, and um, among other things that you may have seen in other courses. And uh, one of his, probably the most, the most famous of his equations and then relations is understanding entropy from a statistical point of view, from a mathematical point of view. 
from a probabilistic point of view. So one can actually derive entropy from fundamental mathematics just by understanding uh, the difficulty or the quote unquote unnaturalness of bounding something to a specific state. So let's look at this scenario here with, with these four, four uh, spheres. We have a red, green, blue, and yellow sphere. And so let's say we have uh, what we're discussing their distribution. If I wanted to have all spheres in the left chamber, there's only one way of doing that, right? Then one, I mean, I, obviously I can, I can replace the red with a green, but it's effectively the same state, okay? If I wanted to split them up into three, one, uh, there are four, four specific states that that occurs. Okay, and in that case, a state is very much similar to what we've been discussing in thermodynamics, uh, it, which is a, a, a an equilibrium uh, entity, meaning it is stable. It, it, there's no drive to move one way or the other. Uh, if you leave one of these scenarios alone, they should, in theory, just stay as they are. And you probably you, you would agree if you if you took four ping pong balls with four different colors and you did that to them. Uh, and they would split into two compartments. Th there's no way, there's no reason for one of the balls to kind of travel to the other compartment. It will stay like that. So it is a state. So, so in in scenario B, when we're trying to split into three on the left and one on the right, there are four I, four states, four possible states for the spheres to arrange themselves. And uh, in scenario C, if we're doing a two two split, uh, there there are six possible states. And then for D, there'll be uh, four states. And for E, again, when we're, bind we're bounding the four, the four spheres into one compartment, there will be only one possible state. Okay. So in this discussion, we're discussing these ideas of states, these equilibrium possibilities. And so um, if you literally took these spheres, these four spheres, and you did the your own experiment, right, and tried to uh, to see what would happen, you would, with the law of large numbers, of course, uh, eventually arrive at this distribution, you know, more or less. Uh, and so what entropy strives to do and what entropy kind of dictates is that it is unnatural for one to expect, it's not unnatural, it's just as we, as we see in the world, it is not reasonable for us to expect, for example, that if you have a pen on your desk, that all the molecules in the pen would decide to point themselves upward and the pen would jump up. Now, it is statistically possible, completely statistically possible, and somewhere in the universe, somewhere far away, I'm sure there's a bouncing pen and everyone's looking and going, whoa, I just did that. It is statistically possible, but the probability of that occurring is next to zero. So we basically don't ever expect it to happen, but it could happen, right? It's just one of many, many trillions and trillions and trillions of states that the molecules in the pen could arrange themselves, okay? So when we impose an artificial boundary or an, our, an artificial restriction on our system, its entropy decreases. So for example, in this particular example, if I remove the partition, okay, the system would be quote unquote happier and its entropy would increase because, uh, because I'm allowing the, the, the four spheres to arrange themselves in more ways, okay? And so in what we're doing with the ice and with melting uh, is very much similar. When we're putting all molecules close together, bound together with intermolecular forces close, close up, we are restricting them from moving around. Whereas in the gas phase, we're allowing them to move willy-nilly as they wish. So the number of states and the number of locations and the number of places that they can travel and see is much larger in the gas phase as it would be in the solid phase. And in the solid phase, they're much more constricted. So we're doing, uh, we're restricting them in very much the same way as we're doing in, in scenario A here. Whereas the gas you could think of as something like scenario C. 
And so this is what is meant by this equation, which we won't use much really, but in this equation, S is entropy, W is the number of states, okay? And K is just the Boltzmann constant, which, which we've used before, it's just a constant. So it's just a proportionality constant. And so you could see that entropy is directly uh, related to the number of states. It increases with the number of states that are available to it. And so that, that was Boltzmann, one of Boltzmann's largest contributions to science. And it is, in, as you could see, engraved on his tombstone. Uh, and so this, this idea is the basis of the field of statistical mechanics. Uh, which is its own separate course, usually given as a graduate level course. Very fascinating course that discusses uh, entropy and then afterwards derives a lot of other thermodynamic properties uh, just from mathematical fundamentals and from distributions. So I recommend that if you're interested.